<laughs> All right, we're doing this. Are you excited? <laughs> you shouldn't be. This movie is hot garbage, and we're going to be talking about why. So if this is like one of your favorite movies, you have fond memories of the book, it's a crucial part of your childhood, I highly recommend you definitely do watch this video because I'm going to be telling you why you're wrong and foolish and swallowing the whole entire unwashed phallus of capitalist come fascist propaganda, which is a very important thing for you to know. On the evening our story begins, it was later than usual when Mr. Jones came home from his drinking to make his rounds. So, Animal Farm was written just before the end of the Second World War. Remember that now, that's important. Before the war ended, George Orwell wrote the novel that this film is spawned from. At the time of writing, the Soviet Union's entire existence was dedicated to fighting the Nazis, losing millions of lives to save the world from fascism. And, spoilers, this movie is about the Soviet Union. Here we have the setting, Manor Farm, which represents the Russian Empire. And here's Farmer Jones, who is the Tsar, that is the monarch or the emperor of the Russian Empire prior to 1917. And now you already know more about this movie than Saberspark did going into this. Yes, I have to admit this video is a response to Saberspark's watch along of Animal Farm, in which for about two thirds of the film he thought it was about fascist Italy. And that made me realize, you know, this is the state of American education. This man went to college for political science. It is a very sad state of affairs, so let's not dwell on it and instead continue watching this train wreck. On this night, all the animals had agreed that as soon as Mr. Jones was in bed, they would gather in the main barn for a secret meeting called by Old Major, the prize boar hog, who because of his years was regarded as by far the wisest of the animals. The other pigs started first for the meeting, being clever and fond of taking the lead. They were followed by Boxer, largest and strongest of the horses, and his devoted friend, Benjamin, the dump. Okay, I'm going to have to start muting this to start explaining because this film is actually really narration heavy. A whole lot of tell rather than show. I think there's a reason for that. The reason being that if you showed too much of the pigs actually being clever, you might just start admiring them. If you actually show Old Major being sick and the consequences of that, you might start to feel sorry for him. Which this film definitely doesn't want to happen, because Old Major is a two-in-one character representing not one but two historic individuals that Western audiences are supposed to think is pure evil. So George Orwell, esteemed supposed socialist, decided that heck with it. Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin can be the same character, why not? Karl Marx, now for those who don't know is one of the fathers of modern socialist thought. He's the man mainly credited with writing the Communist Manifesto, and it's from his name that we take the term Marxist, the ideology that the Soviet Union based itself upon. Like Old Major, uh, spoilers again, Marx passed away before his dream could be realized. The fact that they say Old Major is respected here because he's old and not because he has solid ideas that appeal to the masses does a hell of a lot of obscuring for just a single line. But Old Major doesn't represent only Marx, the economist who popularized the idea of working class revolution against capitalist landowners. He also represents Vladimir Lenin, who was the first successful leader of such a revolution. Before the revolution, Lenin was mainly engaged in agitation, and though he certainly lived through it and was the leader of the Communist Party after the Civil War, he died shortly after, and just on time... These are the other specific historic figures in the film. So first we had Snowball there, who is Leon Trotsky, and there was Napoleon, who is Joseph Stalin. 
Now, both of these men historically were figures in the revolution, with Trotsky being the leader of the Red Army and Stalin himself being Georgian and not Russian, was in charge of winning over ethnic minorities to the side of the revolution. And both were extremely successful in what they did. And now I know I've got the narration muted, but you could tell by the body language, by the way these two pigs were introduced, how they just shoved themselves in there, that they're meant to be shown as pompous above it all and full of undeserved self-admiration. Now, Trotsky was born wealthy, certainly, but Stalin was poor for actually his entire life, and both men went to prison several times for their revolutionary activities. They weren't these spick-and-span demagogues like Orwell wants you to think. And now here, Old Major is espousing the very basis of Marxist ideology, which is class struggle. He says that the animals, that the working class, are the ones who do all the work, but the fruits of their labor are being taken away by the landowner in the form of profit. Now this is pretty based. I think on its face is a good way to explain labor value and profit to someone like they're in kindergarten. Very cool, very good. But this also kind of makes Farmer Jones a two-for-one character himself, as he represents the nobility, the aristocracy, but also capitalists, business owners, landowners. These aren't all the same class, so here, even just a few minutes into the movie, we already have Mr. Orwell completely butchering the very basis of the idea that he's trying to criticize. But remember, when you have got rid of Jones, don't adopt his vices. We animals are brothers, large or small, clever or simple, fur or feathers. Now and forever, all animals are equal. Okay, now, this is where Orwell really starts to show his colors and the fact that he doesn't really know anything at all about Marxism. Marxism isn't about absolute equality. That's a picture that was painted, honestly, by this book. And it's a lie that Western propaganda has held onto very tightly so that it can go, look, the Soviet Union has a state. It has a government. That's not complete equality. Checkmate, communists. So Marx and Lenin were always actually in favor of the existence of a worker's state, of people who are elected to represent and to organize the protection of the revolution, and very specifically, the landowners, the capitalists, were not equal. They would become the oppressed class. This is the main factor that sets Marxism apart from anarchism, and Orwell would know that if he'd ever actually read a single book by either of these men. Oh, and the animals that were singing there? That's supposed to be this movie's equivalent of L'International. L'International is a beautiful and triumphant song written in France and continues to be a staple for socialists around the world. It sounds like this. And this is what this disgusting movie turns it into. And this is what this disgusting movie turns it into. Enough of that. Let's move on. The very next morning, sooner perhaps than old Major would have predicted, the animals found their situation quite unbearable. So this part is actually accurate. 
if a bit simplified. There was a famine and shortages at the time before the revolution, and largely this was because of the war that was going on with Germany. You might have heard of it before. It was called World War I. And the Russian Republic was losing. And there was strong class consciousness then, especially among industrial workers, and they blamed the landowners, the capitalists, for the problems, and more broadly, Russian imperialism. And with all of the men dying on the battlefield, the revolution took a distinctly anti-war and intensely feminist flavor. The same cannot be said for the civil war that happened afterwards. And credit to where credit is due, I actually really like this part of the story. Here we have Farmer Jones scampering away with his tail between his legs and running off to his pub full of his fellow monarchs and capitalists to try to take the farm back. The metaphor works well here. While the revolution was bloodless, it was immediately followed by a counter-revolution from the capitalist class, not only at home, but also abroad. In fact, around a quarter of those fighting against the Red Army in Russia were foreigners. And it was brutal. Between 7 and 12 million people were killed, all told, making it the bloodiest civil conflict in history to this day after the Taiping Civil War. Manor Farm was theirs, and they lost no time in destroying everything that reminded them of hateful Mr. Jones. Oh god. And now we're back to remembering why George Orwell sucks. This implication that the Bolsheviks just had it in for anything at all to do with the capitalists, anything that reminded them of capitalist rule, even to the point of destroying what now belonged to them, handicapping themselves, is just ridiculous. The Russian economy was already backwards. They most definitely took what they could and built upon it, and it admittedly wasn't much after the destruction wrought by World War I and the Civil War. Suggesting that the working class was responsible for that destruction instead, you know, literally rewriting history in the most blatant and perverse way, telling you not to think too hard about it, lest you realize how obviously really stupid and insidious the propaganda is, isn't, isn't, isn't there a word for that? Oh, jeez, it's, it's on the tip of my tongue. Oh, oh right. It's, it's very Orwellian. The animals were all agreed that Jones's house was no place for them. All, that is, except Napoleon. Now, I'll be honest. I have no idea what it is we're being told here. Like, what is this metaphor? Is it being insinuated that Stalin formed some kind of secret faction within the Communist Party by brainwashing the youth? Because that's the most believable theory that I can come up with here, and it's still just... No. Meantime, Snowball led the other animals in organizing a new society, which they now named Animal Farm. Okay, I've got to pause here. If Snowball is Trotsky, that didn't happen. Leon Trotsky put out some really great theory, don't get me wrong, but people also just didn't really like him. Sure, he was the leader of the Red Army, but he was bookish, he was kind of a nerd, and not really all that charismatic. Right now, Snowball seems to be standing in for Lenin then too, which... Okay then, George. One of the greatest writers in the world right here, y'all. see and agree. The laws of Animal Farm were inscribed in a prominent place, to be remembered and obeyed forever. No animal shall sleep in a bed. Okay, okay. The moment you've all been waiting for. Here are the infamous laws, and I'm gonna have to keep pausing as we go. Sorry if you're just super enjoying the movie. No animal shall sleep in a bed. Apparently outlawing anyone from ever having the same level of comfort as a capitalist. This never happened in the Soviet Union. In fact, the whole point of socialism is so that everyone can be comfortable and free without having their labor being stolen. It isn't that no one is allowed to be as comfortable as a capitalist, it's that no one can exploit other people like a capitalist. But I guess George thought that would sound too reasonable for his propaganda piece. 
drink alcohol. No animal shall drink alcohol. This law is actually the only accurate law of the bunch, actually. Kind of, sort of, almost. Alcohol manufacture was completely outlawed in the Soviet Union, that's true. Now, it was before the revolution, too. In fact, prohibition was kind of in vogue during the World War I period all around the world. But Lenin and the Communist Party voted that, unlike many other things, like homosexuality, like abortion, like women's suffrage, alcohol production should continue to remain illegal. That having been said, drinking alcohol itself was never illegal, only producing or selling it. So, close, but no cigar, George. Four legs good, two legs bad. <laughs> the classic. Four legs good, two legs bad. Anti-socialists who've never read Orwell before bleeding this at you like they're a bunch of dumb animals themselves, having no idea what it was supposed to mean. And unfortunately, what it is supposed to mean isn't that much better. It once again shows that Orwell completely lacks any sense of the basics of socialism. Socialism isn't labeling people as having some kind of inherent bad trait. People aren't inherently of one class or another. It's entirely possible to go from being a capitalist to a member of the working class. And indeed, many did following the revolution. But here, as if George really wants us to know that he has no idea what he's talking about, we have this scene in which the pigs make a big deal of justifying that the chickens are just fine under this law. This really smacks a whole lot more of the way that the Nazis functioned with their ethnic cleansing, jumping through hoops to, for instance, justify allying themselves with the Japanese despite their intense racism against other quote-unquote mongoloid races. What Orwell is telling us here is that he thinks being against capitalism is the same as being a Nazi, which, if you don't watch the rest of the video, know at least that this is why this poorly conceived and even worse written book is in every single American classroom and why people can bleat four legs good, two legs bad without actually having any idea what this book is even about. When the Bolsheviks came into power, they actually wiped off every single law from the books and started over. So for a brief moment, about two months, there actually was no law at all in Russia. But the law against murder was, of course, reinstituted pretty quickly. Capital punishment is another matter. The only period in the last 200 years that capital punishment was illegal in Russia, other than those couple months in which there was no punishment at all, was actually for four years under Joseph Stalin. And we've already talked about that, so we'll just move on. Tending farm by themselves posed problems for the animals, but the pigs could think of a way around every difficulty. Orwell really wants you to believe here that the pigs, this handful of Bolsheviks, <laughs> that face, this handful of Bolsheviks just ran everything, that they told everyone what to do, that they must have because the other animals are too dense to take care of themselves, or rather that the working class simply can't run itself. It needs an overlord, in contrast to the fact that the Soviet Union was run by workers' councils. Indeed, that's what the word Soviet means. This really isn't so much anti-communist propaganda that it is anti-worker. It's pro-hierarchy. For someone who supposedly is so anti-authoritarian, Orwell sure does seem to enjoy justifying authority. The success of their efforts delighted everyone, including sly Napoleon and his constant companion, fat pink squealer. It's never really made clear who Squealer represents in particular. He seems to just represent, like, propaganda in general. It's very strange to me.
that summer, the animals, without any help or any interference, made a going proposition of Animal Farm. Without any interference, eh? The Soviet Union was never without immense interference from within as well as from without. The world's largest economy at the time, the United States, didn't even recognize it as a country until 16 years after the revolution. It was plagued by intense economic sanctions throughout its entire existence. Without any interference might well be the most bold-faced lie Orwell tells throughout this entire story. With the harvest safely home, the animals had time to think of the future. And at a meeting in the big barn, many resolutions were put forward. It was always the pigs who made the resolutions. It was always the pigs who made the resolutions. Courage, our first five months plan is a farm-wide triumph. And the time has come to spread the glorious news. So that our downtrodden comrades on other farms will break their chains and join the animal revolution. Go tell the wonders of Animal Farm to the world! So now, to the tune of our butchered, horrible retelling of Lynch National, we have our messenger dove going about and telling the world about Animal Farm and trying to spread the revolution. And generally, it's running into animals at other farms who are just fine with where they are and don't want a revolution. And this is another lie, and Orwell would know it because he lived through it. He knew about the attempted revolution in Germany. He knew about the civil unrest and growing revolutions all across Europe and North America. People didn't just decide to not have revolutions in countries that were doing well, because even in those places, people themselves were not doing well. The difference between those industrialized countries in which a successful revolution did not happen and those developing countries in which it did was twofold. First, Rich countries had the wealth to make concessions to the working class to say, we'll give you welfare and benefits and reasonable hours and pay and retirement and health care and all these things if you just let us keep capitalism. And thus came the welfare state. And second, well, they had the military power and organization to shut down those movements that would not accept these concessions. Here we're being told... You don't need socialism, because, unlike Farmer Jones, the rich people in your country are doing well. Snowball felt that education was the animal's next necessity. Some of the animals were brighter than others, of course. Excuse me? Snowball set himself to solve the problem of power on the farm. And so... Did Napoleon. Oh, wow. Those white dogs that Napoleon saved and brainwashed to be evil are now suddenly black. I wonder if... No, no, that can't have anything to do with racism. Never mind me. In January, there came bitterly hard weather. Inexperienced management brought shortages to animal farm. Inexperienced management, right. Nothing to do with the weather, surely, or the multiple horrible wars and destroyed infrastructure. You see, when it's the Russian Republic that has a famine, it's because of the war. But when the Soviet Union has a famine, it's inexperienced management. And I see we're not going to have any mention of the new economic policy here, so moving right along... Work more and eat less. <laughs> my plan will bring a 
this electricity. It will mean a warm ball in winter. A light in every stall. Sky at roost. Luxury for all! Comrades, in one short year, Animal Farm will be the finest in the world! Dreams, dreams. A vote for my plan is a vote for the life beautiful! It's a lie! I'll promise you a four-day week. Bosh! Perhaps a three-day week. Nonsense! <laughs> this is so ridiculous. The idea that Trotsky was exiled slash assassinated because people liked him more than Stalin? He was voted out. He was never very heavily liked. He was acknowledged as a great revolutionary and a prominent, highly educated thinker, but his idea of permanent revolution kind of capsized when the Soviet Union tried to spread the revolution by force to Poland and lost territory as a result. He was a very contradictory person, and like me too, and that continued after he lost power in the party. The root of Marxism democracy is called democratic centralism, in which everyone votes, but once you all vote, then that's the line. Everyone voted for Stalin's position to be given authority in the wake of Lenin's death, and Trotsky continued to oppose this. Everyone voted to favor Stalin's less expansionist idea of socialism in one country, and Trotsky continued to oppose this. Whether or not he deserved what he got is a debate still to this day, but to me, it doesn't really matter. What does matter in the context of this movie is that it most definitely didn't happen because Trotsky was popular. It was because he was trying to start shit, specifically because he wasn't popular. What was he really planning? To bring back Jones. <gasps> Let's have no more of these useless meetings. Hey. Eh? From now on, I'll protect your interests. And I'll make your decisions. <laughs> Yeah, so now we just have a hodgepodge of a scene of just Napoleon being blindingly evil, ridiculously so, ending democratic meetings, lying, stealing Trotsky's or <clears throat> Snowball's ideas, surrounding himself with enforcers. This all has nothing at all to do with reality, but this is the way in which people think of Stalin as a result. Nothing could have been achieved without Boxer, whose strength was greater than that of all the other animals put together. So, Boxer is meant to represent the Stakhanovite movement that celebrated people who were particularly productive with their time at work, gave them extra compensation, turned them into national heroes. It proved to be a very useful economic strategy in the short term, as it both raised people's morale in tough economic times and increased productivity. It will be repeated again a few times throughout Soviet history and even emulated by other countries. Superintended by the pigs, all the animals worked long shifts, which lasted from dawn till dusk. Excuse me? The eight-hour day was made a nationwide rule by the Soviet Union. It was one of the major reasons that workers abroad envied the revolution and tried to make it happen at home, too. Orwell, Orwell, could you please stop lying for literally five minutes? Just give me a break. 
rations were shortened for the workers, but the pigs, by virtue of their brain work, were plentifully provided for. Uh, apparently not. There is no evidence at all of preferential treatment of Communist Party members, if that's what this is meant to imply. Word of what now went on at night in Jones's house spread quickly through Animal Farm. Some of the animals thought they remembered a law against beds, but obviously they were mistaken. <sighs> yep, definitely meant to imply that. And more Orwellian crap of, look how stupid workers are. Obviously the leaders are corrupt, but the common man is too dumb to do anything about it. It seems too silly to believable, it probably is. Chickens seem to remember old Major saying that their eggs should never be taken from them. More silliness over here. I guess the implication is that the Communist Party took profits from the workers and used it to benefit party members by trading abroad, which isn't true. Again, there were immense sanctions placed upon the Soviet Union. They could only export a few basic resources such as grain. And again, there's no evidence of preferential treatment of party members. They didn't own property, they didn't extract profit. They planned the economy with the necessary imports and exports in mind to meet the needs of the people. Okay. Here, out of order, we have a rebellion against the Communist Party, I guess. There was never any rebellion with claims of capitalism on their mind. There was Kronstadt, quite frame famously, which happened during the Russian Civil War. Though even they didn't accuse the Communist Party of capitalist practices. But maybe this is instead talking about Stalin's purges? But again, these weren't purges of people who thought that Stalin was a capitalist or anything like that. And they weren't purges of common people, they were purges of politicians who themselves had reactionary intentions. Yes, Trotskyists, but also so-called right-wing socialists, people who thought a little capitalism would be a good thing. People like Khrushchev would turn out to be. Again, you can say these purges were necessary, you can say they were extreme and unnecessary, or like some, you could say that they weren't extreme enough, given what happened to the Soviet Union after Stalin's death. Orwell couldn't have known how that would go, but, you know, you can. Napoleon getting rid of L'Internationale. This happened during Orwell's time too, and this guy must have been living under a rock. L'Internationale was seen as basically a terrorist anthem in capitalist countries. The UK ran a TV program every day that played the national anthems of their allies during World War II, but they continually refused to play the L'Internationale, which was the anthem of the Soviet Union at the time. The change to a new song specifically citing the fight against fascism was intended to be a way to say to the West, look, we want to work with you. We want you to accept our existence and see us as an ally despite our differences. And it worked. Kind of.
Okay, a little late, but now it begins. Finally, finally, the Second World War. Here, we've got the farmers representing the fascist alliance, and we've got the invasion of the Soviet Union. And like the last invasion, this is actually one part of the movie that I kind of like. Because the humans don't use human wave tactics, or animal wave tactics, like the Western propaganda would usually like us to believe. The Soviet Union instead used tactics called defense in depth, basically retreating into your territory and using the environment and guerrilla tactics, as well as attrition, to combat a stronger opponent. So, good job, Orwell. You did a thing. Hmm. Yeah, the destruction of the windmill, symbolizing the massive damage that the Soviet Union incurred during the war. Now began the heartbreaking job of rebuilding. And as before, Boxer and Benjamin worked hardest of all. By now, supervision of the work by pigs was hardly necessary, so they had time for less laborious pursuits. And here we're at a point in history that Orwell was just predicting. He didn't know how things would be after the war, but they certainly weren't like this. A new generation of pigs grew up, endowed with what were considered arts and graces very flattering to Animal Farm and its presiding genius. Stalin's cult of personality, it seems. Did you know Stalin actually hated his own cult of personality? There would always be a vote on some new way to use his face or his name as propaganda, and he would always oppose it. He hated public speaking. His poetry was studied in schools, as before the revolution, actually, he was kind of a minor celebrity as a poet. But they were always under a pen name. He tried to resign from his post even as leader of the Communist Party, not once, not twice, but three times. And every time, he was voted down. No, he's not dead. But he may as well be, because I have no idea what the hell Orwell is trying to say here. That the Soviet Union pissed away its population who were unable to work? That it worked its people to death? Their retirement age was 60, and 55 for women. 30% of the population at the time were pensioners. This compared to the United States today, in which only around 8% of people are retired. There was a robust health system, and with the power that the workers had over the workplace, although that wasn't perfect, it still meant much better working conditions than those in capitalist countries of the time. This, this is just straight up bullshit. I was with him right to the end. His last words were, forward comrades, Long live Napoleon! <sighs> Once more, a population that hates its country but won't do anything about it. Hates its leader but won't do anything about it. Apparently. Working people are stupid, etc. And also, again, it's not true. Stalin was incredibly popular all throughout his life, not only at home but abroad. Hell, he's still popular in former Soviet countries today. And also, why the hell is Squealer giving Nazi salutes here? On farms owned and operated by pigs, there is order and discipline. Our lower animals do more work and eat less than on other farms. <laughs> this 
We encourage you to make your lower animals work even harder and eat even less. Okay. More of just the same. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Pigs are now just the same as the farmer, blah, blah, blah. Even if you don't know the story, you know the story. More utter nonsense. Now, Orwell actually ends the narrative here in the novel, with Benjamin just noticing that the pigs have basically turned into Farmer Joneses. The movie takes it a step further with another revolution. And I have to wonder, what did the writers expect would happen after the violence ends? Would things be better, simply because it's other animals and not pigs, running the show? Are they saying it's just a pig problem? Or are they more pessimistic in imagining that this is all just going to happen again, now only with, I don't know, the donkeys becoming farmers in the end or something? We are stuck, basically, between the movie either suggesting that some groupings of people are immutable and inherently bad, so, you know, basically racism, or else that the human race is doomed forever to be exploited no matter what happens. I'm personally guessing it's the latter. It would very much fit with another Orwell quote that people love to give despite not knowing where it comes from. That quote is, if you want... A picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. Absolutely fucking shit, writer. <laughs> Don't read the book. Don't watch the movie. Zero out of ten. Where the fuck did that rock come from? Actually, better question. Why the hell did I do this to myself? <sighs> fuck this movie.